Good evening. We are uh, about to begin our Vacation Bible School for this Tuesday night. We're glad that you are all here, and we uh, have some visitors with us, and we're glad that you're here especially, and we uh, want to thank you for coming and being our honored guest. Uh, as you can probably tell from the screen, we are looking at the stories of Jesus and his early years, and this evening... Uh, we will be going and looking at the wise men and their visit uh, to Jesus, and we will be looking in Matthew chapter 2. If you'd like to open your Bibles and turn there, we'll be getting there in, in just a moment. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this evening that we have to come and to study a portion of your word, and Father, we are mindful at this time of the greatest gift that you could give us and the gift of your son and father we are so thankful for that and lord we pray that you will be with us as we study at this hour and that you will be with all those who are teaching and learning and studying your word that we will find what you would have us to do in our lives that we can understand the truth in this that we can understand how you have made valid that this is your son this jesus of nazareth and how he came and lived and died on the cross of Calvary. Lord, we pray that you will guide us and protect us. Forgive us when we fail you. In Christ's name, amen. So as we look at the wise men, and uh, we will, at the end of this, uh, time allowing, we will look at their uh, escape to Egypt. And so let's just jump right in to Matthew chapter 2 and beginning in verse 1. Where the text says this, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. So what do we have here? We have wise men, or magi, as some versions have translated. Who were wise men? Who were magi? Who were the wise men from the from the east as we look at? Okay, there were obviously people that studied the stars. They looked to the skies. So we may say they were astrologists. They uh, evidently looked for answers amongst the stars. Uh, magi, if we look through history, uh, it comes from the the word comes from the same place that we get the idea of magician. Uh, as you would see, it's kind of just short for that. Uh, magician, the Magi's were astrologers, mathematicians, magicians. Some of them were sorcerers. They were learned men of old. They studied the writings of, of others. Uh, they were just trying to be well off. They were trying to be wise. Uh, some were led by evil ways and evil means, and they had their downfall. Uh, these men, particularly, were looking into the sky for something as to what we don't know uh, a lot of times we think about these guys and we think about that well they looked and they saw a star well that's that's just great and wonderful uh, but what were they looking at in the stars well they were looking with their naked eye because this was before the time of telescopes this was before we had any satellites up there to link anything together they were just looking at the sky and trying to discern what they could discern from but when we look at wise men and look at wise men throughout the history of the context of the Bible, we find out in Daniel chapter 2 a little bit about some wise men. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream, if you'll remember, in Daniel chapter 2. It says, Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. Now, if you're unfamiliar with what's going on here, Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream and he wants them to tell him what it tell him what it means which is all well and good if you knew what the dream was but Nebuchadnezzar didn't tell him what the dream was he said I want you to tell me the interpretation of the dream that I struggle with well tell us oh great king what it is he said no it don't work that way you got to tell me what it means well who can do that who can tell you what it means the Chaldeans uh, said this in verse 11, the thing that the king asks is difficult and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with the flesh. 
So even these Chaldeans and what we will consider wise men, they look and they say, you know, nobody can do this. God, only the gods could do this. And if you look around, there's no gods among us. This, the dwelling of them is not in the flesh. They couldn't do it. So in verse 12, we find out that Nebuchadnezzar had them killed. He had them torn limb from limb. He, he said, I've, I've, I've fed up with you. I want to put you to death. You're going to be no more. And so he has his army, he has his uh, secret service, if you will. They're going to go out and they're going to wipe out everyone who is claiming to be uh, the sorcerers, magicians, enchanters, uh, the Chaldeans. He's going, to, he's going to kill them all. And they get to a guy that you may remember whose name is the title of this book, Daniel. And he says, well, just wait just a minute. Let, 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 me, let me go talk to the king right quick. Let, let me go tell, talk to the king and... and and let's, and let's just see, you know, if I can't help him out. So they get to Daniel, and he begins, Daniel begins to tell him what his dream is, and then he begins to tell him the interpretation of the dream. And the interpretation in this particular dream is uh, one that Brother Robert has referenced several times uh, during this vacation Bible school of the different kingdoms that were going to come and go and how they were going to be, and, and how the ones of old, the ones of new, and the one that, that is to come. So he, he begins to tell him the interpretation of his dreams, and so by that, Nebuchadnezzar knows, hey, this guy is the real deal. As a matter of fact, he says this in verse 48. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the who? the wise men of Babylon. So Daniel is not just going to take over and just he's now going to be a wise one of these wise men. He's going to be the wise man of wise men. He is the above all over the whole province of Babylon. He, he was not just going to have some region. He's not going to just have some little area that he's going to be in charge of, that he's going to look after, that he's going to think about. But rather, he's looking over the whole province of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar saw the value in Daniel and having him as kind of a right-hand man within his kingdom because Daniel is going to be able to look at things and, and prophesy about things and know things that we're not going to get to know. So when we look at Babylon and the, how Daniel is going to be the chief prefect over all the wise men, he also gave uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego some other high-ranking responsibilities at this time during the course of these events within the king's palace. But to go with the context of our lesson, what about Babylon? Well, where is Babylon located? If we look at a map, we can see pretty clearly that Babylon would be east of Jerusalem. So if these wise men are going to come from the east and we have a reference of wise men in Daniel, we could very well be talking about people that had studied and learned after Daniel and those after him. I mean, we are still talking several hundred years of a time frame in between these two. But the idea that there was wise men present, there was wise men in the east, and they had a job, and they did some studying, and they looked, and they learned, and they studied more, it was not just a, a focal point of just, we're going to study what's around us. No, they were looking to study, as people would say, I learned abroad. I never learned I never learned abroad, unless you consider Calhoun abroad from Ardmore. That's about as abroad as I got. But we, they learned everything. They learned everything that they could about everyone. And they, they studied. And so here we have just kind of a reference. I, I, I like to think of this as maybe these people were after Daniel, uh, having known the things about that they knew about the king of the Jews that they, they were going to come and look after, as we're going to read in just a moment. But these people could be from China, for all we know. Is China east of Jerusalem? Yes, it is. Uh, we don't know where exactly they're from, but I have a, a gut-wrenching feeling within me that says that they have some sort of tie to Daniel because of Daniel's influence in Babylon and from then on after, as, as maybe you'll see as well. So, what about these wise men? How did the wise men know? How did the wise men know what they knew? Well, they said, we saw his star when it rose. They said, we saw his star. Now, if you're not aware and you haven't been up late at night and watched infomercials, you can buy a star. 
you can buy a star and you can buy you can you can pay nineteen ninety five for the basic package or you can pay hundred and nine dollars and ninety five cents and get the duo deluxe package and you can get a, a certificate and you can name a star after someone. If you're looking for an anniversary present on a whim there, you can you can order her a star, guys. Did you know that? You can order her a star. But here are these wise men and they say, We saw his star. Well, how did they know it was his star? How did they know about some star that was his? Well, then we have to go back a little bit further, and I think this shows us maybe the tie, the linchpin, if you will, of how the Hebrew influence in Babylon may have carried down through Daniel to get to these wise men. But nonetheless, they knew of the writings of the Hebrews and uh, the writings of God. So here, here it is in Numbers 24, verse 17. It says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and shall break down the sons of Sheth. So here we are. We have this prophecy of how coming from the oracles of Balaam here in Numbers 24. This is the final, last hurrah prophecy that uh, Balaam would make. And we have reference here to a star that will, is going to come out of Jacob. It, it's... I can see him, but he's not. But it's not right now. He's close, but he, he's he's still a little ways out. Uh, so here, here we go. We say, see all of this kind of tying together uh, with these wise men and, and some of the things they obviously had studied. So back to Matthew chapter two and verse three. It says this: When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So he gathered together all the chief priests and all the scribes of who? who whose chief priests and scribes did he gather? So what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to ask questions and y'all are just going to blurt out answers. They don't have to be right. We, we won't... We won't. We won't put a bad grade on your paper. You just, you just blurt out an answer if you think you see it in verse 4, right after it says chief priests and scribes of who? The people. The people. All right, so he's the chief priests and scribes of the people. Now, this kind of tells you a little bit about Herod, okay? Because Herod says, I ain't really one of y'all. Y'all is y'all, and I, I is me. I'm not really with you, but, you know, I am your king, and I am your ruler over you, so why don't y'all just come... And y'all tell me about this Christ and where, where was he going to be where was he going to be born? But one thing about Herod's nature in this and his feelings was was what? He was troubled. Why would Herod be troubled? Yeah, it's good. Somebody's gonna take his place. There's a king, there's a new king born. Here here I am I am I am. He is self proclaimed king of the Jews. He's the ruler over Judea. He, this is his job. Here he is in Jerusalem doing mighty and wonderful things for the Jews. And on the other hand, he's killing his own kids. So, I mean, Herod has all kinds of problems going on, not only with him, but with his brother and his ruling. And his son would come after him, and he was bad off too. So we have all these bad things, but here he is, and, he's in, and he did all of these things to stay in control. Because Herod is kind of a lot like us. We, we, when we have control of something, the last thing that we want to do is give it up. If I've got control of a situation or I have a position, I, I don't, I'm not really keen in on trying to give that up. And here is Herod, and he's in that same boat. He's a ruler. He's the king of the Jews. And now here comes these wise men off from the east who most likely didn't just travel with a couple of folks or three or five. I mean, this is probably a gathering of folks with some, with some you know, clout that they had. And here they come in and they go, Herod, there's some folks at the gate. Well, one of them folks at the gate won't. Well, they said they're here to see the king of the Jews and they want to know where he's supposed to be born at. And he said, well, we got a problem. But it says also, and all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. And I find that very interesting that Jerusalem would be troubled. I don't know why they would be so troubled. I don't know if it was just, well, if the king's bothered by it, then we need to be bothered by it. It could be that simple that well, he's got to, you know, if he's not feeling good about this, maybe we don't need to feel good about this because evidently something bad's about to happen. It could be the fact that they were troubled because 
they didn't know any better. That, that they, they too were like, well, what, what's going to happen to us? If we get a new king, you know, maybe he's not going to give us as much free range as what Herod's given us. Because pretty much as long as we don't bother Herod, he doesn't bother us, and we just kind of go on about our ways. But if we bother him, then he kills us, you know. So there's always that. But at least, you know, we know where you stand with Herod. It's kind of like one of those things of you stick with the devil you know kind of deal, right? So maybe, maybe it was that. But Herod was troubled because he was really kind of worried that somebody was threatening his crown. But talking to the chief priests and the scribes, they said this in verse 5, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and we have looked at this uh, on uh, Sunday night, oh, you, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people. Quoting there from Micah. So they give him the answer. And, and they tell him that, you know, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. So they kind of had this little scene over here. And so then Herod kind of comes back and he says, All right, all right, wise men, you come over here. And he summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. So I almost picture this uh, because you, you only picture things that you have seen before uh, like, like in Matlock and you got the judge sitting there and that's Herod and they said a sidebar your honor and so they bring forth this group over here and he said where is he supposed to be born at well they, they say it's in Bethlehem okay well y'all go y'all go sit down oh, alright now you come over here and let me tell y'all something now, this is what you need to do you need to go they say he's going to be born in Bethlehem so you go to Bethlehem and you find him and when you find him, you'd come and tell me where he's at so I can come worship him too. So they went on their way. They, they're going to go and they're going to tear out and do just that. And they said after listening to the king, they went their way. And behold, the star that had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great Joy. So here, here they are. They, they've, they've left the king after he said, well, all right, well, uh, y'all go on. You, you go find him, and you let me know when you find him where he's at. And so they go, and they leave, and here they are. They look out into the night sky, and there's the star. And when it rose and went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Now, when, when you watch the stars at night, you know, it, it, it's kind of a, a, it's kind of overwhelming on a lot of clear, pretty nights. Right now, you sweat to death if you go out at night and try to watch stars, so you may want to try it again a little bit closer to the fall. But when you look out, <clears throat> the stars kind of come up, just like, you know, we say the sun comes up and it goes down. Well, the stars kind of come up, they hit a point, and then they just kind of go back a lot of times right back the direction kind of where they came from. And what they call an astrology, they call that the resting point, the peak point that that star hits. That's the, that's the resting point. And so there's been a lot of people who think, well, what happened was they, they left out and they saw this star, and it went to its resting point, and they said, well, all right, we need to go that way. We need, we, need to go, we need to go that way, and they got excited because they knew which way to go. And it came to rest of a place where the child was. And it says, and then in verse 11 it says, And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. So if we go back to verses 9 and 10 and look at this for a moment, we're not just talking about a resting spot in the sky. Because if I look at those stars out in the sky, it don't take me to a house. I mean, if I'm looking at a star up in the sky and I look at Orion's belt and I'm like, I'm going to walk toward Orion's belt. Well, I can only walk so far because there's Orion's belt. It doesn't come down over a house. So if we're trying to make sense from this from an astrology standpoint, well, we can for a while, but eventually that loses its favor because, you know, it, it does more than just, you know, shine bright in the sky because it leads them directly directly to a house a house for them to go into so 
In verse 10 it says this, When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They were excited because now we, we've seen the star that we've been following. We followed it. We, we went to Jerusalem with it because you know, that's the capital city. We're going to go to Jerusalem with it. That's, that's where we're going to find the king. And now we're here. And they said, go to Bethlehem. And now here, here's the star again, and we're following it. And he said, go to Bethlehem. And there's the star. It's leading us to Bethlehem. And, and they're, they're just filling up with joy because they, they know this is, about, this is about to happen. So they're excited. But here's the thing. When they got to Jerusalem, what did they tell King Herod that led them there? What was it? It was a star, right? They said, it, we, we saw his star, and so we came here. And he said, but we're trying to figure out where he's at. Well, they said, well, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. You go on out there. And then Herod, having known that they saw his star, and then Herod goes out on his balcony that night, and he looks out to the south. You think he saw that star? So on one hand, you've got somebody excited, and, and loving every minute of this and thinking, hey, we're about to see this new king. And then you've got somebody else going, these folks are for real. You know, if there, if there was ever any doubt in Herod's mind, it just kind of all went away. Because when he looked to the south and he saw that star, I'm going to say that his reaction was not rejoicing with exceedingly great joy. His, his response would have almost had to have been, I've got to find this guy. I've got to find this child that is born because this is real. This isn't something that I, uh, that they're just crazy. They, I mean, this is real. So when they got to the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They fell down and they worshipped him. And then opening their treasures. I love that. They opened their treasures. Ain't nobody ever opened no treasure up for me. They opened up the treasures and they offered him gifts gold and frankincense and myrrh and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod they departed to their own country by another way they opening then opening their treasures uh, and when I read this again you can only see what you've seen before I just see them getting off of these camels and they, they open up a pirate's treasure chest and they're like here you go this is for you. We're so glad we get to worship you. And I read gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We asked the kids one time, I said, what did they bring Jesus when he was born? They said, gold, frankenstein, and myrrh. I don't think they brought him frankenstein, but it was pretty close to that. Well, gold, I'm kind of, I'm kind of familiar with seeing gold. I know what it looks like. I know that it has intrinsic value. And so today, to to make this relevant for us, I did some research, okay? Based on today's spot price of an ounce of gold, one pound of gold, if that's all they brought you, one pound of gold was 20, would be $29,984. Pretty good. They'll buy a tank of gas if you get in a pinch. If you, if you get a gallon of frankincense, it's about the same. A gallon of frankincense... It's $25,223.46, okay? Myrrh, well, the market's falling off on myrrh. Myrrh is not quite as much as it, as it used to be in, back, in, back in that time, evidently. Myrrh today for a pound of myrrh is $13.95. That's what you can order. You can order it on Amazon for $13.95 for a pound of myrrh. But if you got lost in all those numbers there, one pound of gold, a gallon of frankincense, and a pound of myrrh would bring you to $55,221.41. So that's saying that their treasures weren't so big, you know, because I can put a pound of gold in my pocket. I'd like to, but, and I don't have it, but, I mean, I could do it. And, and so, you know, and a gallon, you just think a gallon jug is... is Frankincense. I mean, are they going to have that, or I could just say if they've got they've got this vat, they've got this barrel that holds you know 30, 40 gallons of frankincense in it. So we run those numbers out. And we're over a quarter million dollars here pretty quick, and, and so they're they're not just giving him what they got left over. Okay, they have brought him stuff of great value, and they have offered this to him. And not only did they bring him treasures, you know that's one thing 
that we oftentimes, and, and I myself, we focus in on, they brought him treasures, they brought him great gifts, and they did. But these were wise men with power. When we go back to think, think about this, what Daniel did. Daniel was the prefect of the wise men. He was the wise men of the wise men. These were like the king's, you know, kind of like uh, the president has his cabinet members today. The king had his wise men. He had these cohorts with him that he heavily, heavily depended on. And here's what they do. They come and bow and worship him. That was, that was far greater of an admission on their part that they appreciated this child, as it was worded, the child being born, they fell down and worshipped him. When they did that, that was more than anything they could have given him. Financially for them, they, you know, we'll just go get more gold, we'll go get more frankincense, we'll go get more mirth, you know, that, this, is, this is a great offering that we're giving to you, but, you know, the fact that they worshipped him was far greater than anything that they really could have given him. The fact that they were willing to humble themselves and give him that says something great about them. Now, when they gave him these gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, these were not just some random you know, things that they grabbed off the shelf. They, these were things with some kind of purpose behind it. In Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 6, the multitude of camels shall cover your land, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. So we have Midian and Ephah and Sheba. There's a multitude of camels from all over your land. There, these people are coming from near and far and everywhere. And they are bringing him great gifts. Midian is southeast of Jerusalem. Ephah is down to the south. Sheba is modern-day Ethiopia. It's on the east side of Africa, near the, the, the Horn of Africa. And some people claim that, you know, the, the uh, wise men, they knew. They had read the writings of Isaiah, and they knew what to bring the king. And I, and I think, well, okay, well, they would know what to bring a king. That, that, will be, that will be good. But nonetheless, even if they did not know, and what they did was just, you know, them bringing the most valuable things that they can find of great gifts. The happening of this uh, just fulfilling prophecy, you know, it isn't just something that I, I think just happens. And so they brought the gifts that was dictated that would be brought to the Lord. Uh, I, I don't know... Uh, the wise men, I know they came and I know they brought gold and they brought incense. They brought two types of incense. They brought uh, frankincense and myrrh. So if we look at these wise men, I've got some questions for you. Number one, how many of them was there? At least two. At least two. So we have, a, we have singular would be man, would be wise man. And then when we know it was just one, when we go two or more, well, we know it was wise men. So we really don't know how many wise men it was. Now I don't say that to burst your bubble. Uh, if you want to, you can still go out and you can sing We Three Kings of Orient are Star of Wonder, Star of Light. You can sing that if you want to sing it. That's fine. Just know that it may not have been three. They did bring three things. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We don't know how many of each of those things, but they at least fell in with those three categories. So Here's this. Why did they go to Jerusalem? Why would, why would they go to Jerusalem? Yeah, they, they're trying to find the, the new king. With it, and Jerusalem is the what city? The capital city, right? That's where the king's at. That's where we're going to go. And so that, that's why they went to Jerusalem. Where, where's, where does the king belong? Well, he belongs in the, in the capital. So that's where we're going to go look. What sign were they following? A star. a star. Okay, yeah, they were following a star, and specifically it was his star. They knew that there was something special. There was something different about this star that, that was unlike any other. And here's question number four. Why did they not return to Herod? Okay, they were, they were, they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. Uh, if we think about their return to Herod, Okay, if they did one of two things. Uh, 
they could have they could have went to Harry. They could have went to Harry and told the truth. We found the king. He's at two seven four nine five uh, Frontage Road, and you can find him right there. He's in the house. They could have went there and told the truth, told him where Jesus was, or. They could have went up there and they could have told Harry, you know, we went to Bethlehem, we looked all around for him, and there's a bunch of babies being born, but none of them's, none of them's the, the one that we're thinking about. He's somewhere else. So they could have lied. Either way, I don't think those wise men get out alive. If they go and they tell him the truth, Harry already knows I'm about, to, I'm about to go kill this child. I don't want anybody knowing I killed this child, so let's just kill these wise men too. Thank you for doing your job. If they went and lied to him, he don't know that they lied to him until they, he's not lied to him because he still thinks they're telling him the truth, so he's just going to kill them in too. There was, there's really no way, I think, for these wise men to get back home if they go back to Herod. Uh, so they didn't return because they had a dream. Uh, an angel appeared to them in a dream and told them not to, so they, they being honoring people who had some sort of root and reverence for, for God, uh, whether it was Jehovah or not, I could not firmly state, but I do know that they honored him as king. They, they revered Jesus. Uh, and with that being said, they followed the angel's you know, command. Hey, listen, you don't, need to go, you don't need to go this way. You don't need to leave this way during this, when they had this dream. So they weren't the only ones that had a dream, though. They weren't the only ones with the, with the angel coming to them. Uh, in verse 13, it says, When they departed, when they left, I, the wise men, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. Remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child and destroy him. So, this angel had a, had a busy time. He's had to tell all these people they need to leave and they need to get out of Bethlehem because of what Herod's about to do. And... Is Joseph, you think, you think about Joseph at, at this moment. You don't want you to put yourself in Joseph's shoes. Everything that just happened to you is a strange, strange thing. And, and we find time and time again, and Mary pondered all these things in her heart. And she kept all these things in her heart. She, and so here's Joseph, and he had an angel appear to him, and they said, you need to go to Egypt. If there was ever a time where Joseph doubted you know, an angel or uh, a message from God speaking to him, he's pretty much over that at this point. He's pretty confident that this, this is the real deal. I need to get, he told me to follow this, and I was kind of, maybe he was unsure. Maybe, maybe he wasn't unsure. Maybe he was full-fledged faithful all the way through and had no doubts in his mind or in his heart. And, but at this point, there's for sure, he's got, there is no doubt left in Joseph. There, there's no way that anyone in their right mind is doubting what's happening. Okay, rise and go to Egypt. Okay, what, what about if I what about if I go somewhere somewhere else? There was no bartering. There's no kind of like let's try to figure out a different place. Egypt's too hot. It's not the time of year to go. He went. He's ready to go. Angel said to go to Egypt. That's where he's going to go. Herod is about to search for the child and to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken about the prophet, out of Egypt I call my son. So, <clears throat> Joseph and Mary, I, I'm not exactly sure how they decided to leave and go to Egypt, uh, but lo and behold, how handy would it be to have few hundred thousand dollars worth of money in your pocket when you need to get out of town you know that would be pretty handy well, luckily some wise men just brought them a bunch of gold frankincense and myrrh they could put that on Facebook marketplace and Craigslist and they could sell that and dump that real quick and get out of there so I don't know that they did that I'm not entirely sure but I would find it extremely handy to have hanging around a few extra denarii in my pocket if I'm trying to get out and leave Egypt especially if I'm trying to do it in haste uh, and, and, try to, and try to get down to Egypt as quick as I can knowing that Herod's about to destroy my child. Because if somebody tells me that my child's about to be destroyed, you know, there's not a whole lot that's going to stand in my way of making sure that that doesn't happen. 
I'm about to handle this the best I can. <clears throat> and uh, so they do. And this was to fulfill the prophecy of out of Egypt I have called my son. Now, Egypt had been a safe haven before. Uh, it's not really what I wanted to put on there. I don't know why I put that. Why did I put that? It's not really what I was trying to ask. Let me y'all y'all just pretend like y'all just pretend like that's not up there. Okay? Let me ask you what I really wanted to ask you, okay? Had Egypt ever been used before to call out God's people? Where were they at when they were in we know after Joseph? Uh no, oh, no, hey, that's I'm glad I looked at you. I don't know why you helped, but you did. Egypt had been a safe haven before. How did the where where had where had Jacob and his sons gone to to find refuge during the famine? They went to Egypt, right? Luckily, Joseph had gotten right hand man to Pharaoh, and he was there and he took care of. Them. And so they it became kind of a safe haven before. It turned real quick when another Pharaoh who didn't remember Joseph got in command, and so he brought them out of Egypt. Well, he kind of does this again. He kind of Hey, you need to go shelter in Egypt for a little while, and I'm going to call you back out of Egypt when it's time. And, and we're going to do this all over again, more or less. So Herod and, and murder, here he is. Then Herod, when he saw what he had been tricked by the, that he had been tricked by the wise men, he became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem, and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time of which he had ascertained from the wise men. So, here, here, here's kind of what's unfolding now. So, Herod realizes the wise men ain't coming back. They're not going to come back. I don't know. I don't know how in the world they got lost in between here and Bethlehem, but they're not coming back. So, he's mad. And he's not going to just find the child and destroy him because he can't find him. I don't know which one he is. So he decides that he's going to destroy them all. I, I, I do not know, and, and Brother Robert, I, I, I was kind of hoping he was going to give a firm answer. He kind of had the same answer I did last night uh, on this. I, I don't know how old Jesus was. I got a range. I, I believe he was somewhere between eight days old and two. That's that's a pretty big range, but I, I can rest pretty confidently in that that that's how old he was. I also don't know exactly how long the wise men followed the star. Okay? But I know that they followed the star and evidently they had told Herod how long ago they had been following the star. If we knew where they came from, even exactly, whether it was Babylon or India or China or, or where they exactly came from, I mean, we could kind of figure out how long it would have taken them to get there, how, how many months or weeks, or, or if it would have taken them just over a year, based on how far of a distance that is to Jerusalem. We really don't know any of that. Uh, but we can know what we know from the scriptures of saying this, that he was somewhere between eight days old and two years old. And so Harry knew, hey, well, he's got to be under two. And so let's just make two years old. To, you know, maybe, maybe they said we've been following it for 18 months. And he said, I don't want to mess up. We're going to run this out to two years. And, and we're just going to take everybody, all, all these under two years old, we're going to wipe them all out. We're not just going to do Bethlehem. We're going to do all this region, everywhere around here. If you can find someone under the age of two, I want you to take them out. Now, it says this in verse 17. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children, she refused to be comforted because they are no more. You talk about a gut-wrenching feeling. Let there be no more children. 
let there be all these preschoolers, small kids, he's learning how to walk, learning how to talk, they're, they're gone. Not just yours, all of them. All of them that you used to see in the street, all of them you used to see at the marketplace, all of them you were running around, they're no more. Rachel weeping for her children, you talk about the pain and the hurt. You talk about a reason to want to hate somebody like Herod, this is a great reason to hate him. Because of what he's done. And they re she refused to be comforted because they are no more. How? The idea of how, how would someone go about being comforted in this moment? That not only is your child gone, but all of their friends, all of their children, all of the everyone around them, they're all gone. Now, I want to read to you one moment here. This came from uh, the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, in all of this, he says this about this new covenant after these events have occurred. He says this new covenant will come in verse 33. He says this, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is it. This is what it all has boiled down to. That they will be his people. The word of God is no longer going to be in a temple or a place. It's going to be written in their minds and written in their hearts. Thank you for your attention and your answering and questions you asked.
baby wipes and diapers. What? Gold. Gold is one of them. Frankincense. That's a big one. And then myrrh. Just three. They just brought them three. You got it. All right. Let's sing some songs, okay? Let's sing Jesus Loves Me. Y'all are going to sing loud, okay? You ready? Jesus loves me, yes I know. Oh, that my will tells me so. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna shout, I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna shout, raise 
Y'all turn around and boost them, okay? And then after we sing, we'll, we'll have uh, Brother Adam lead us in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. You want sing with me? Okay. Boost the rich to be a blessing. Don't be glad you are the